I'm Mark Harris, Beef and Lamb New Zealand Extension Manager based out of the Eastern North Island and your facilitator for the evening. I want to shout out a big thanks to colleague and fellow Beef and Lamb Extension Manager, Ellie Forbes, who has put the big metres in setting up tonight's webinar. Also a shout out to Dean Cinnamon, Beef and Lamb New Zealand Extension Manager, Southern South Island, who will be helping monitor the questions. Olivia Weatherburn, National Extension Program Manager for Beef and Lamb New Zealand, who is providing the tech that makes this webinar tick. Olivia has put a lot of time into the tech managing role for all the previous Sow, Grow, Thrive webinar series sessions to empower farmers for financial success. I will now hand over to Olivia to run through how the evening Zoom will operate. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the So Grow Thrive series webinar number five. Just a little bit of tech to help you this evening. If you need to ask a question or anything tonight, please add it to the question and answer little block, um, bubble that you can see at the bottom of your screens. We ask that you do keep your videos and sound off due to the great rural broadband we have across the country to ensure that this webinar can go without any glitches. We will get to those questions throughout the evening and ensure that you go away with the answers you need. Should you have any tech problems tonight or need any assistance, you can get in touch with myself uh, either by messaging me through the chat where you can go into the chat and then where it says everyone, you can actually just select myself and send me a message or you can send me a text on 027 801 7868 and I'll put that in the chat for you all as well. Throughout tonight we will be adding any links that are referred to into the chat and the following of all webinars there will be a summary email that will go out. This webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Beef and Lamb Knowledge Hub at the end of the week as a podcast and video, and the link will appear in this week's e-diary. If you have any other technical things you'd like us to, to go through, please just uh, put them there in the chat for us. Tonight, we're going to be spotlighting our speakers as they speak and be also showing a slide presentation. To be able to just to see the speaker that is speaking, you can select just to speak at view when they come up so that you can only just see one tab ac across the board. But when we push spotlight, they will be the ones that will appear. So you'll be able to see them to the side of your screen. I'll now hand back to Mark and I hope you enjoy the evening. Thanks, Olivia. Rodeos in life come in many forms, up and down. Both our presenters have experienced the number of these in their careers, including the global financial crisis, drought, cyclone, regulation, and stress that get thrown our way from time to time. It is with much pleasure now to introduce our two guest speakers for the evening's topic, insights with experience for effective financial communication and relationships. Over the past 20 years, I've got to know Matt Hood, both personally and professionally, through various contributions he has made across our industry. These include his roles as MZ for the Beef and Lamb New Zealand Sheep Industry Awards, now the Beef and Lamb New Zealand Awards, which actually have been held in Christchurch next week. Maybe some tickets still available, so jump on the website and get yourself registered. It's a great evening celebrating our industry. And also emceeing the Balanced Farm Environment Awards, his promotion, facilitation and support of the Red Meat Profit Partnership initiatives, the East Coast Rural Support Trust and his role as a respected agri-banking professional on the East Coast of the Lower North Island and now in sunny Marlborough with BNZ Partners. Matt's personal mission is to make a positive impact on agri-business and the clients he's involved with. He is passionate about seeing people succeed in business and bringing top young people into the industry through well-structured succession and farm syndication options. With a strong family farming background, various professional roles across Australia and New Zealand, and nearly 20 years in banking, he brings energy, experience, and sometimes a bit of light entertainment to his interaction. He's a proud dad to three teenage daughters, and notes he has to often remind them that he only works for the bank and didn't rob one. Welcome, Matt. 
Thanks, Mark. Hope you can hear me. Looks like I'm having some video challenges here, but I uh, do have a face for radio. Mark, I see you're still struggling to say South Island there in your introduction, mate. That's uh, no surprises there, eh? Sorry, can, can you hear me, Mark? Sorry, yeah, I'm, Mike, we can hear you, and you're right about the face for, for radio. Uh, South Island shouldn't be an issue. Um, my mother would uh, tune me up if I did pronounce it wrong. Is there anything else you like to add, Matt? I'm oh, just really looking forward to tonight, and thank you, Beef and Lamb, for the opportunity to come along and contribute to this. I know in these sorts of times it can be pretty challenging for people as they look to navigate their way through a bit of a downturn, so hopefully something that Dan and I can add uh, helps. People can take it away and, and make a difference. But other than that, really looking forward to the evening. Thanks, Matt. And you just mentioned our next presenter is Dan Billing, Senior Agri Relationship Manager for ANZ. 12 years now based in Dannyburg and is currently Vice Chair for the Beef and Lamb New Zealand Eastern North Island Farmer Council. Dan also farms his own property east of Dannyburg with his partner Sarah and all their children. Dan has grown up farming, fencing, shearing up and down the east coast. He finished managing farms in the Gisborne district before moving back to Dannenberg to work for ANZ. As part of his sharing expertise, Dan has used this to put back into the community with the 24-hour sharing challenge raising funds for rural mental health support. Dan now works within the wider east coast, Warapa and Manawatu regions, supporting a variety of agribusinesses. This role is a special role in that allows an, an intimate understanding of the businesses that he works with helping to understand the future plans and establishing a pathway to achieve future goals and intentions. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Mark. Hey, uh, good to be here. And uh, it's probably a better intro than I was expecting uh, after you just uh, introduced Matt there. I was uh, expecting, uh, well, here's Dan. Well, we, we can uh, do that, but, so here's Dan. <laughs> yeah, but I am looking forward to tonight. And really tonight, I just really want to uh, help people just get a little bit more comfortable with how they actually talk to people and grasp and take a little bit of responsibility for things in their business, you know, themselves and their business over, you know, times that we're seeing at the moment. You know, Matt and I have spent a bit of time, put together some good material. So this is actually going to be a pretty exciting evening. Cool. So Dan and Matt, is there anything else you'd like to kick things off with before I ask any questions to kick it out? I look at, I mean, uh, really what we want to talk about here is uh, is nothing groundbreaking here. It's nothing uh, that you're all of a sudden going to sit there and say, uh, this is something I've never heard before. What we're really wanting to do here is just be very down to earth, very pragmatic, and uh, just about encouraging the use of common sense as you approach your business. Yeah, good one, Dan. And I think the other thing, like any good bank we're going to put a rider on stuff right the riders for us really as we don't we don't have a mortgage on a lot of good ideas we've just had a, a range of different experiences between us and we're more than happy to share those with you as they are and i think as dan alluded to you know, some of this will be obvious right and um, it's a bit like the far side cartoon that's just popped up you know this guy's been around and he's painted and everything the tree the house the door the shirt the dog the cat with a caption yeah, now that should, should should clear a few things up around here. And I think sometimes it's just really important that we're aware of the same obvious, especially with families where they're involved in farming and you get into stressful times. One of the first reactions that some people might have is to stop talking and stop sharing some of the obvious. So you know, tonight will just be about sharing some of the obvious, but hopefully we can package it up for you in a way that uh, that resonates and lands and give you a few few tools you can take away to help you build meaningful relationships, not just with family, but other stakeholders, including your bank. So that's, that's a good sort of intro, guys. And I just wonder, before we move on, if you, you've both banked your way through a few industry cycles, as we mentioned earlier, what are a couple of things that you've observed and learned that you could share with us at this point? Well, if you actually flick through to that next slide there, Mark, uh, we'll be able to... What we really want to do here is actually, uh, you know, start here and, and change things up a little bit. And if we sit and think about where we actually want to end up and use that as a start point for where we're actually going to go, there's four real key points here that we actually see, uh, you yeah, know, consistently in the businesses that we work with that actually continue to be successful through tough times. And 
they're not groundbreaking. They really are simple. It's about ultimately about uh, you know knowing the business, knowing what can what uh, actually controls the business, what influences business, and what you actually can do to uh, to impact that or influence it. It's about how you actually ultimately take control of those influencing factors within the business and how you manage those. And there's various ones in there. It's, uh, and they are actually going to be a little bit bespoke to each business. So it's not like we're sitting here saying, here's what you have to do, but it's about understanding the concept. And uh, the other side there is about being able to be proud, of, not be proud, too proud to ask for help. It's about being brave enough to sit there and say, I might be struggling in something here, or I may not know what's going on here. So can somebody please help me? Because if you sit down and think about it logically, group intelligence is far superior to an individual mind. And you know, by default, when you actually have a conversation with somebody and when you actually ask that question, uh, when you go to somebody and ask ask for help and ask a question of them, they will, by, the, you know, by through experience, uh, actually be able to help you through that. And the last bit there is actually just, you know, take responsibility for the business. Don't leave it up to others to make those decisions for the business or yourselves or your family. Make sure that it's you who's actually being the one that's actually grabbing everything by the scruff of the neck and giving it a good shake and making things happen. Yeah, good points. Good points, Dan. I think the other thing that we want to try and acknowledge here as well is that We've got people at the end of this and there will be different responses from people from time to time as you go back to that previous slide. Yeah, there'll be there'll be different people that have different responses. But the you know, the key thing is your part of knowing your business is also knowing yourself and just understanding how you respond to stress and adversity and downturns and ensuring that other people around you have got a bit of an idea of, of that as well. Uh, you know, people get a bit frustrated, disillusioned, angry, depressed. Um, some might see it as an opportunity. But uh, you know, through our experiences in uh, in dealing with people through downturns, it's really important that we get beside them and understand them and understand their business. So the more you can know about your business, what drives it, the key fundamentals, that you're prepared to take control of the areas that you can make a difference in. You ask for help in those other areas that you can't. And we just be responsible with each other and respectful. So I think they have yeah, four, four really good points there. Dan, I'll just share something quickly around that ask for help piece. I remember running a session in Nelson years ago and we had John Palmer as our after dinner speaker. And he, John was New Zealand chairman of the year, three out of four years in a row or something. And uh, during Q and A time for this meeting that I was facilitating, somebody asked the question and said, you know, John, what's your secret? I'd love to be able to emulate just some of your success. What's your secret there? And John said, it's pretty easy. I just don't let my ego get in the way of a good decision. And you could see people sort of tucking that away as the silver bullet. And I said to him, John, what do you actually mean by that? And he said, Matt, it's like this. My job as chair of these businesses is to make sure we're employing people who are far smarter than what I am to do the jobs we're asking them to do. And he said, he said if I don't, the business will only ever go as fast as me and I'm just not that good. And I just think that ask for help people is, is recognising if you know your business and you're taking control of the stuff that you can control, but you ask for help in those areas where you may have some deficiencies or there are people who are far smarter than what you are, you know, get on and get on and do it and just give yourself permission to do it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, just following on for that, I mean, it's, it's not about sitting there saying you're a failure by asking for help. That is the, that is the most, uh, that's the least uh, thing we want to say here. Asking for help is actually the opposite there. It's actually admitting that, hey, there are some other people around, like Matt said, that are far more intelligent and uh, yeah, clever in the areas that we actually need help with. So let's go out and find that help. It's all about making things uh, ultimately more successful. Thanks, guys. That's some really good advice there, just the nice observations. I just want to encourage people to please uh, get some questions in the chat there. We want this to be interactive. The guys are really open to the questions. So I think I've got another one here for you guys to sort of lead in here. You represent representatives of a couple of banks supporting agriculture in New Zealand. What do agri bankers want for their clients? Yeah, good question, Mark. Dan, I might kick mm. this one off if you like. Mate, go for it. Yeah, we've got a slide there, but ultimately we want our clients to be successful. We want them to know that they're supported by us and their and their financial institution, the wider resources that they each bring, and uh, you know, we want them to know that we care. So, during those tough times, we want to have those conversations with them early. We want to be able to engage early, and uh, and sit down and understand what's going to be important to them as we navigate our way through this time. Mm. 
and I think Dan's got a, we've got some slides up there. I'll get the first yeah. couple down if you like. We, we mm. want to know mm -hmm. what you know. There'll be a whole heap of things that you will know about your business that we may not. There'll be things that you know about uh, your goals and objectives that we may, may not be aware of, your capabilities or otherwise that we may not be aware of, your resources within and outside the bank that we may, may not be aware of. So we just want to know some of the things that you know. So being able to package those things up and put them to us succinctly so we all know the same stuff. And I think it goes back to that first far side cartoon slide of let's just state the obvious and make sure we know what you know. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's um, you, the really, really prudent things that you say there, Matt. And, um, you know, it's not what we, when we talk about what we, you know, what you want to know, we want to know what you know. It's not sitting there saying we want to know, you know, how many, you know, what sort of stock you're running, what sort of, uh, you know, lambing percentage. I mean, that's all given. We expect uh, all the people that we interact with to have some sort of knowledge around that. When we're talking about, we want to know what you know, it's about understanding sort of where you've come from and where you're going as well. So there's a little bit more to it than just, the, the facts and figures, it's about understanding you know, why the people were talking, you know, it's about understanding the conversations and the intent with the people that we're talking with. Um, so if we have a look at those last, the bottom two points there, we're talking about who, we want to know who is in control and that's really coming around to who's making the decisions in the business and uh, how are they been made? What is the decision-making process or the decision-making cycle as some people call it within that business? Who do you use to actually bounce ideas off? Who do you use to actually make those key decisions that actually have some long-term impact to the business that you're actually working with? Uh, yeah, and I'm going to put a caveat around the term business because I, I use it quite loosely. When I say business, it is a tendency to move you know, yourselves and your families as well. So uh, it's it's all encompassing when I say that. Um, that last bit there, you know, we work on a theory, uh, show us, don't tell us. Uh, it's all good to, for people to actually sit there and say what they want to, uh, what, what they're trying to do or what they're actually trying to explain to us. Uh, or to tell us what they you know, want to want to try and do and what they're trying to you know, get get to. But uh, if you can sit down and evidence it and then put some really strong rationale around uh, what you're trying to do there, it uh, it's it a little bit of weight to the argument or the to the you know the proposal that you're actually trying to talk through a bank with. And when you actually have a tendency to write things down, it becomes a little bit more measurable and a little bit more accountable too. Uh, in terms of being able to actually build a little bit more structure around how we go about processes for achieving those outcomes. Uh, it's this again, like, we're probably going to keep reiterating and, and saying the same things as we go on, but it's all about common sense. It's all about making sure that you're inclusive of everyone. Um, and, you know, and ultimately sitting there trying to ultimately, you know, from a bank's point of view and, you know, from Matt and I's point of view, when we work with a business, ultimately what we want to do is actually become a partner in that business, not just a commodity person that actually sits here and provides cash. Ultimately, we actually become invested in the businesses that we work with as well. Uh, and, you know, we we struggle when they struggle, we hurt when they hurt, and we actually like to think that, you know, when at the businesses and the people that we work with succeed, so do we. Yeah, good point, Stan. I think the other thing for people to realise is after the Royal Banking Commission in Australia, there's a few things that changed in banking for us. You know, one of those, if you think about some of the findings, what they found in Aussie in particular was that uh, bankers were doing evaluations, bankers were doing the budgets and bankers were being remunerated for lending out the door. You know, and you think, well, what could possibly go wrong? So our functions, we don't do valuations anymore from a lending as a lender, we, we can't do budgets for people. We can do them with you and mm. walk alongside you as you as you do them. Mm. And there's no there's no attachment of, of lending to, uh, of remuneration to lending. So the important things for us and the way we get measured is on the relationships that we have with our customers and how we're helping them achieve their goals. So a large Matt, part of what we... Sorry? Yeah, just keep going, Matt. I want to pick up on this point once you're completed. I was saying a large, a large part of what we do and where we get our currency from, I think Mark, as Mark said at the beginning of this session, I come from a pretty strong farming background, as does Dan and most other agribankers you'll come across. So, you know, our, our roots are in, in farming and, uh, and agriculture, and we, we really want to see the people that we're working with be as successful as they possibly can be. Yeah, yeah, you did just, right. Ed. Just like to pick up on that. Um, I've heard uh, a little saying I've used a bit as goals are dreams with deadlines. 
So if goals are dreams with deadlines, where can you as agribankers help clients to realise their dreams? Because I hear you're talking about working with clients. So you've got a couple of examples there of how you can help them realise their dreams. Ha. I might, just in a moment, I might get Livia to jump through to the to the uh, farmer slide in a minute. But it's interesting, you know, having been involved with a lot of different farming families, both in Australia and here, one of the common things we see, especially when people are under a bit of pressure, is we, is we stop talking, right? So one of the roles we can play is getting getting every all of the stakeholders around the table and just making sure we're clear about what's really important to them and getting those things written down. Mark, and I think you know, goals become or dreams become mm. goals when you write them down, yeah? So we actually just get them written down and, and keep it simple. Just keep things really simple. What are the production goals? What are the family goals? What are the business goals? And then what are the first steps we're gonna to take towards those? So just putting mm. an action plan in place. Yeah, I mean, just add into that a little bit there, Matt. I mean, when we sit there and talk about how do we pe achieve, help people achieve their, how do we help people achieve their goals? That was a tongue twister. Um, it's all about sitting down and trying to facilitate honesty. If we can actually have some really honest conversations with all parties that are involved, you know, whether it be intergenerational or uh, between you know, partners, shareholders, uh, intermediaries, uh, you know, controlling influences within the business, that's where we see the greatest change actually come from is when we actually start getting some honest, robust conversation going. But it's in a way that it's actually facilitating in a way that is actually constructive to the outcomes of that business. Um, making sure that you know everyone's open, everyone's heard, everyone feels like they're what they've said is valued and has actually been understood by everyone else around that table as well. That's where we see the biggest change come from, and that's not just in good times. That's in you know in bad times, tough times, stressful times, changing times. No matter when you uh, talk about it, honesty sits at the uh, at the root of everything that helps us change things. And the other piece to that, Mark, just to round that out, I think is making sure that we're all calibrated about the same mm. obvious. So we're calibrated what the balance sheet looks like, what the historical viability mm. looks like, what the projections, you know, we just litmus mm. test things and make sure that we're all really well calibrated mm. around those key fundamentals so we can support people as best as we mm. possibly can. Yeah, yeah. So just, hey Mark, can you just go back to that, that next slide there? And there's three, there's three, uh, there's three points there that we were talking about. One, you talk about uh, financial factor, personal factor, and financial factor. So it's just a little bit of context around how when a bank comes in and uh, makes an assessment of people or a business or a proposal or you know, support that we're actually giving people, here's some of the three things that we actually look at. And if we can actually get some really good structure and some really good um, you know, processes around how uh, we as bankers uh, get this across and you know, ultimately everyone as clients or the people that we interact with come back to us with, then we can actually get some really good outcomes and how we move forward. So physical factor is, you know, how well are you actually operating within the business? Are you, are you managing that business well? Are you doing things on time? Are you asking for help in the most timely manner? You know, it's, it's about how do you physically actually manage the business itself? And I'm going to use the term business because in, in stay away from the, the term farm because, they, uh, the farm is the lifestyle versus the business that actually, you know, provides the outcomes. Um, then you've got the personal factor. And essentially, that is us sitting there backing the person that we're talking to in, in tough times or in stress times or in times when, you know, we're, we're backing young people for the first time or there might be a little bit uh, something out of left field that isn't there. We will more often than not back a person where they, uh, you know, they've proven themselves to do what they say they're going to do, follow through with things they they've promised to do, and actually deliver upon, you know, the the outcomes that we've actually asked them to deliver upon. And then, you know, that last bit there is financial factor. You know, how well do you actually manage the financial side of your business? And that's not sitting there saying, you know, yeah, you give us an up to date budget every three days. Or uh, you know the exact you know dollar and cents balance of your own, of your account. It's making sure that you are responsible and prudent with how you manage your, the financial aspect of your business, and always be honest in it. The bank will always work. Yeah, uh, will always find out when you're uh, when you're lying or when things haven't gone right. So it's better to be upfront and honest as opposed to sitting there trying to tell porkies. Sorry, Matt, I was uh, cut in front of you there. No, that's right. You go for it, mate. You go for it. Uh, 
think about it like this though those three factors the bank will look at say three or four things it's like a three-legged stool one leg might be the bank's That's security right. the other is the personal management factor and then the other piece is the viability and we want to be able mm -hmm. to assess those have good quality conversations about where we see some of the uh, the deficiencies or the risks and the challenges and make sure that we can fully address those with you because, you know, the reality is it's your equity that's at risk. It's your, it's your journey. It's your dreams, your goals. It's our opportunity to help you. And part of that is, is sometimes having good quality, challenging conversations where we think about different options and opportunities that we may not necessarily have thought about uh, if we didn't have those good quality conversations and just said yes. Yeah, so there's a high degree yeah. of, of desire to want to help people be successful through good quality, uh, robust conversations around the, the security, viability and, and personal management factor. Mm -hmm. And the top of the stool really is just those things that tie it together. It's your business and personal goals and objectives. I think there's a comment coming or a question sort of come in on the chat that probably ties into the next slide for you guys. But um, just about SWOT, now, doing a SWOT on yourself and your business is important to cover all these little things that you're chatting off to. So just wondering if that's part, um, as you're leading to the next slide, that that uh, you find that helps out when you're uh, helping a business or a family go forward. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, any any due diligence or any information or any processes that any of our clients or any of our, you know, it, we work with people that aren't even our clients too. So it's not just limiting it to our clients, but you know, any people that we work with there, the more work they do in understanding the variables within their business, what influences the business, what they control and, you know, where ultimately the challenges and the, the opportunities are actually coming from, the better. So if somebody can come to us with that information already pre-populated or in a position where we can actually sit down and have, like Matt said, a good, robust and honest conversation to flesh things out and understand how that actually marries up with the longer term goals and intentions of everyone. That stuff's pure gold. Yeah, it certainly is. The mm. Just a, a thought on that. One of the talk about variables and just understanding those. If I digress a little bit, I think about when we had the dairy industry downturn a few years ago. And I think there's Chris Lewis from Baker Ag, Lawrence Field, who I see is on the call. G'day, Lawrence. Uh, Leo Hendricks and Dave Sinton, we sort of pulled a little group together and put together some resources that we thought would help dairy farmers. And part of that was actually just looking at the sensitivities to things like production and milk price. And it was pretty simple. And we, we've since done this for sheep and beef as well to a different degree, right? But if you stand back from your budget and you add up all your costs and deduct any non-milk income, so net livestock sales, Fonterra, dividend, and anything else. The rest has got to be serviced by milk. If you divide that by your production, give you a break-even in-season milk income. If you mm. know what your in-season milk income is, divided by that, give you a break-even production. So you can start to look at some, some of those fundamentals and your sensitivities. If you take your surplus and def or deficit and add it to your farm working expenditure and divide by your production, give you a break-even farm working expenditure per kilo. Same with you, similarly with your, with your interest costs. With sheep and beef, you know, for a lot of our sheep and beef businesses, uh, greater than 70% of income comes from sheep and probably 75% of that comes from lambs. So you follow the same principle and just basically add up all your costs, deduct any non-lamb income, the rest has got to be serviced by lamb. So just a way of looking at your business slightly differently and thinking, well, what are my sensitivities? What is a good price for my lamb? Or what is a good level mm. of, of production at any contracted prices that I've got? Those just a bit of a, a tip and a trick when you sort of think about knowing your business. It could be just looking at some of those variables and fundamentals and understanding what are our sensitivities to some of those market, uh, um, yeah, market pricing mm. movements or production movements. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, this is, when you talk about know, you know, knowing your business and being aware of what influences it, I can guarantee that everyone on this call will sit there and understand where the key drivers in their business are. But what I can also guarantee is that not everyone's aware of the impact around various decisions on those influences in their business and how much, like you point out, Matt, you know, how sensitive their business is to some of those key drivers. And that's where you know, having that understanding of what you can control and what you can influence within the business is actually really important to understand that you know, the decisions you make, you know, what are the implications of on your business because of those decisions, which is in lines with that bottom bottom point be responsible for the business because you know when we talk about you know some of those points earlier that in the, at the start of this presentation and as we've alluded to going through tonight you can't just 
can't uh, you can't just think that everything's going to work out because it won't. You have to be responsible. You have to take control of your business to ensure that you're actually ultimately going to get through the other side, either you know as unscathed as possible, or you know depends what success looks like. To be fair, you know success might be getting through the other side with as uh, little scarring as possible. It might be that uh, you know getting out in a controlled manner might be that, but. I guess it's about making those decisions and taking responsibility in some way, shape, or form. It's um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's an interesting one, Dan, isn't it? Yeah, my experience would be people stress the most about the stuff they don't know, mm-hmm. and we get a bit of avoidance when it comes to doing budgets. And I'm sure you've seen it before. And I know if we did talk to somebody like Lawrence, who's been uh, who's been pounding onto the sheep and beef and dairy industries for for a long time about getting your budgets done, people stress about the stuff they don't know. But by the time you've sat down and actually done your budget quantified what you think the the surplus or loss is going to be and then decided whether it's going, it can be amended by some policy changes, dropping some costs, changing a stock policy or something, or whether it needs to be some structural changes to survive. You know, at least you can make those decisions, at least you know. So I think you know, one of those one of those stresses for people is uh, is when they, they don't know stuff and it should be a bit of a trigger for us to think, okay, if I'm stressing about that, then I need to know it. A bit like our health, really. We can put up with stuff for so long, but you've actually got to get in and get it done and mm. get along to the doctor for the checkup. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it is, it's a great term there that um, it's a health check, essentially. You know, if you can identify where the rot is, then you have a tendency to be able to fix it. I mean, so guys, yeah. yeah. Guys, guys, I wonder, just you mentioned that, talking about budgeting there, whether we flick on the budgeting sustainability slide and um, open that one up. Oh yes, it's yeah. uh, but, here's a question. Here's a question for you though, just on that. But Matt, how often do you go and you talk to a client where uh, to build a bank budget? Oh, look, from from time to time, Dan, I think we we you know, yeah. sorry, it's probably not the answer you wanted, but we just tend to spend a fair bit of time with our clients and making sure that mm. between them and their accountant, we're pretty well calibrated at what mm. across what they're doing. The mm. big challenge is actually. It's not just getting the first budget done. It's actually, it's actively reviewing it as we go along. That's the big challenge because it's all very well mm-hmm. to have a budget. You biff it in the drawer. It doesn't mean anything. And then it's thinking back to those fundamentals you talked about. And people, you may want to write this down if you've got a pen and paper. But really, only three things change in a budget as you're going along and overwriting it with actuals. It's the volume of stuff. So the volume of widgets you're planning on selling, be it lambs or kilograms of milk solids or wool or venison or... Uh, um, what do you call, to any of the different commodities mm-hmm. it's the volume of that that might change the value of it so whether lamb prices have dropped or beef prices or they've gone up so you can amend those or the timing timing is a classic mm-hmm. we often see it with fertilizer people will have done the original budget with fertilizer and they'll have 147k in there for fert and of course the, the actuals overwrite those budget periods they've put the fertilizer on they spend 147k but they've taken deferred terms so when you're sitting down looking at their budget, they say, oh, well, we're better off at the moment. Yeah, by about 147K. And it's only because that, that number hasn't been moved from mm. behind the actuals out into the period where it's actually going to be paid. So if you, mm. if you want to keep budgeting simple in your own minds, just think about it. There's three things that change, the volume, the value, or the timing of things. And Danny, if I can just tip in on top of that, you know, and I'm sorry if I digress, but hopefully this makes sense to people. If there's any pilots out there, I'm sure you'll get it. I was living with a mate in Sydney years ago, and I was reading some of his civil aviation magazines, and there'd been a, a number of light plane put downs. So they hadn't made it to their destination. And I said, Ned, what's all that about? And he said, it's like this, Matt. They take off from point A, their instruments telling them from all intents and purposes, they're pointed towards point B, but they might not set their plane up properly or they've got a bit of a crosswind or something and they end up flying right off course. They put down because they're a bit lost or they're getting low on fuel. I said, how does that work though? And he said, well, they're operating under VFR or visual flight rules. He said, what they should be doing is setting themselves up a couple of little benchmarks along the way. So if they, if they are off track, then they know early and they can adjust. But other, if, because they don't, they just keep going, keep going. The instrument's telling them they're pointed towards point B, but they just don't quite get there. And I think for us with budget, setting a budget, but then revising it on a regular basis, there's those little check-in points to make sure we're on track. And if we're not, then we can make those adjustments at that point in time. 
Yep, it's those uh, you know, regular updates uh, that are actually very important. Actually, making sure that budget is is actually relevant and um, has some some sense of reliability in it. It's, uh, which is sort of comes back to that you know, the point that we've got up there is when you you build a budget, be realistic with what you're actually trying to do in there. And we don't when you talk to a bank or you talk to your accountant or any of your other uh, you know, advisors that you might have within your business. We don't want to see a budget that is all of a sudden, you know, hugely optimistic and hugely uh, overinflated relative to what you have done historically. And but yeah, at the same time, we don't want to see one that is overly harsh. And you know, where you've sat down and uh, under forecast prices and over forecast costs because you think that's the right thing to do as well. What we want to do is actually sit down and get a true understanding of how you see the business running in a realistic way. It's um. Yeah, that's really important. And, um, you know, there are so many times when we sit there and actually see that and we've actually got to sit down and have some good conversations to try and, you know, get that back into a point where we are actually comfortable with it. That uh, we look at this point here and we see cash is king. And I know that's a, it's a bit of a, uh, it's a bit of a sticking point in an environment like this, but uh, the the point behind that comment there is actually it's about protecting the income that you're actually generating in a year and actually making sure that you're actually using it prudently and in the most uh, productive way. Uh, some of the things that set you know the the top twenty percent of operators in, in red meat aside from you know the average or the the, the you know the bottom fifty percent is actually they understand where they spend some money in a, you know, the, every dollar they spend actually gets them a uh, dollar twenty and dollar thirty back. So it's that investment in what they put in their productive costs actually gets a genuine return as opposed to just spending money for the sake of spending money. Um, you know, those points down there where we talk about productive, fixed and discretionary costs, I mean, everyone has a view of what productive and fixed and discretionary costs is, but if we think about these slightly different you, know, you, you put in the context of productive costs of what you actually genuinely need to spend within your farming or financial year to get that you know, keep your business humming and keep your business producting at its highest level. You know, you're talking about your R and M, your fertilizer, your animal health, your regrassing, uh, your sort of reinvestment back into the farm in a way that is sustainable. And then you've got your fixed costs. These are the costs that don't go away and you can't influence. So you're talking about your, your interest costs, your rates, things like that, That uh, your, your, your drawings. They are actually where we sit that and see that in there because they are what has to happen within the business any given year and you can't do without it. And then these are the discretionary costs. This is the bit that's a little bit different to what people have you know, historically thought about. Discretionary costs are those nice to haves within any given year. You know, this is the two or three Ks of extra fencing that you might have actually thought you were going to put in, but you probably shouldn't this year because it hasn't got the, you know, you haven't got the funds to actually do it without going into a cash negative scenario or using your overdraft or, or something like that. It's making sure that you're aware that, uh, you know, you don't have to spend some of those things if you don't have to just for the protection of cash. So guys, yeah. just, um, just here, Matt, I was going to come in on this one is, um, it's been a bit of a common theme through these and interested how you guys manage this when you are assisting your clients, um, the budgeting in a tighter year like this. Um, and uh, the knee-jerk reactions, I always go for the big stuff. Um, just sometimes those little small things, if you add them up and you hit three or four of them, you can still get a reasonable outcome of uh, managing cost. Yeah, it's a good point, Mark. I've re I refer to it as the salami effect. You go and buy a nice salami and put it in the fridge and you come back a couple of days later and it's all you're half gone. You say, well, how did that happen? It was just disappeared one small slice at a time. And sometimes you're, you're dead right. We need to focus on the small slices across different areas that won't have that long-term effect on the business, but will maintain a bit of cash and capital and liquidity within the business. My good mate, Doug Avery, did an article years ago and he talked about uh, tough times and managing your capital. You know, you manage your financial capital. You get uh, sell stock early if you if you've got a tail in your flock or your herd. Get rid of them rid of them early if you know you're not going to have enough feed. Put the money in the bank. Look after your natural capital. Don't overgraze. Make sure you're keeping your fertilizer up, your water, and that sort of thing. And look after the people. So that sort of three pronged approach to just looking after your capital. But the way you do that is starting out with a pretty clear plan, and uh, and being able to measure that on a reasonably regular basis. And the other thing we'll often talk about is that sort of, and we might get onto this a little later, but no surprises, right? And in terms of no surprises, we think about no surprises for you or us. 
is in a tight year, you're looking to make sure or reduce the risk of having what we'd call dead debt. Dead debt to me would be debt that comes as a surprise. You didn't realize you were going to have it. Or as a result of money that was spent on things that didn't necessarily need to be spent or as a result of inattention to, to stock requirements and stock policies, grazing, uh, prudent selling policies, those sorts of things. So it's trying to, trying to mitigate dead debt because your top operators will limit losses. They'll limit losses and they'll limit them to one year as best as they possibly can just through that active, active management of their financials. That last point that you make there, Matt, is actually well said. It's, um, you know, going through times like this when you know that you're actually going to take a bit of a hit, it's important to actually sit there and actually try and, like you say, manage it and, and retain it or, you know, uh, you know, keep it in as, you know, one year as po if possible. You know, for those people who uh, manage to spread it out over two or three through poor management of stock, through poor management of finances, that's the guys who are actually, uh, you know, ultimately it becomes a snowball effect where it's, um, you know, debt creates debt and ends up in a, in a bit of a downward spiral that we're, you know, then Matt and I have got to step in and try and find a solution for. Hmm. Yeah. Mark, you've, you've got a pocket full of questions. What else have you got? In fact, while you think of one, how about we ask you one? Mark, you're normally pretty up to speed with this. You get to look at a lot of businesses across the East Coast and other parts of New Zealand. In your experience, how would you describe the, the traits of a top operator in the industries? Oh, that's that's not fair, Matt. That was my question eight for you guys. <laughs> um, I don't know if Liv can find. I, I might have dumped a bit of a slide in there, um, but thanks for putting me on the spot, eh? Um, yeah, Here's this something just, you prepared earlier. Yeah, well, I've, I've used this one for a bit, and I've been trying to challenge, and it's bright people like yourself and Dan that'll it'll give me if I've got the answer right. But this is what I've sort of observed through my own mistakes in, in watching others and learning up others. But I tend to see top operators are really focused, you know, so they've got an issue or a challenge or they're buying a new business, they really get focused on it and understand it. And I think with farming, they look at the land platform and they manage the correct policies to suit that land platform. So, you know, if it's a class three hill country property under our system, they'll run a really top class three business on, you know, um, policies on it. Um, and they're really realistic. And, and you guys just been chatting about this. So you set realistic goals and targets. So, you know, they, they, they don't, pie in the sky they work out what they can do and they might push the boundary a bit but they make them realistic and the, and the big one I think is, and this is what you're talking about they own the plan and they execute it so they sit there and open a plan and, and they execute it and in saying that if they need to move 10 degrees left because the weather's changed they just do it um, and they monitor and benchmark really really well so you know if you monitor you can't manage it the old saying and they'll benchmark them either internally or against others, whether it's within a you know, bank benchmarking system or the economic service system or, you know, whatever they use. And I think the other one, they utilise the team um, really, really well, whether it, whether it be the junior shepherd, everyone has worth in their business. And I put in brackets governance, I think they get that pretty well stuff really well as well, whether mm. it's mum and dad, and they understand, you know, where they sit in the business. It's quite often they are the CEO and quite often they can be at the bottom of the pile as the junior shepherd too. Um, and you mentioned timing is one of the things of your three things that cannot change. They're really good. They have their finger on the pulse, so their timing is, is pretty good most of the time. And I think they're also really, really good communicators. That, that's my summary, Matt. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my starter for 10. Good work, Mark. Good work. We had to make you earn your money tonight, my friend. <laughs> it, it's uh, almost like you've actually gone back and uh, you know been riding those nights as we were going there. Matt, because a lot of those are actually sit there with the four key points that we said at the start. Yeah, it's well, just about taking control and asking asking for help and being communicative. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Dan. Yeah. Uh, they've been sitting on my benchmarking workshop PowerPoint for quite a while, but <laughs> the things I've learned off others, I would never be um, uh, big enough to say or big head enough to say that that um, I, they're all, they all fit me. I've still got a lot to learn. Yeah, mm. Dan. Thanks, Mark. Dan, do you want to talk to this next one, looking into the future? Yeah. So one of the one of the really big things that we do, you know, Matt and I do when we go into a business uh, in work with not just new people, but with existing customers or businesses or anyone else, is actually trying to understand why people are doing what they're doing. And the reason we look into that, look to do that, and look to understand that is then it allows us to help build a pathway or a strategy for 
helping them and supporting them into what that outcome might look like. It, it allows the you know, clarity and perspective around what people are actually doing, why they're trying to achieve what they're trying to do, what ultimately drives them. And having that understanding from a banking point of view is, is really important and really valuable and making sure that we are then aligned with those, uh, with those goals and aspirations that each individual has in that business ultimately is uh, set up to try and achieve. It's um, also helps when we have those conversations, it's uh, also about us trying to flesh out and help people understand and put in context what they're doing if they don't have that clarity. You know, there are a lot of times when people we work with will actually get up and they'll be farming just because that's what they've always known. The, uh, fundamentally, they know why they want to be doing it, but they just haven't actually expressed it. And they always want, you know, there's uh, the times when they actually want more and trying to set those goals and expectations or goals and aspirations out for themselves allows us to sit there and go, well, here's some lines in the sand that you actually need to achieve. You actually need to actually make sure you're 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 heading towards yeah, and uh, you're, you're actually looking to try and make those manageable little steps to actually look at the bigger picture of things in there. It's um, you know, it's about trying to hold people to account and create some responsibility for outcomes when we're looking at this, looking into the future. It's not because we're sitting there trying to work out how much more money we can poke into you, because it's the last thing we really, yeah, you know, that's not what drives us. What drives us is the successful outcomes of the people that we're actually working with. And it might not be growth, it might be succession, it might be uh, you know, you know might be those people that are looking to downscale and might be you know, looking at some other alternatives. It's, it's just understanding how we can actually be, you know, invest our time more prudently and wisely with the people that we're working with. Yeah. Good, good point, Stan. Again, I think that that why is interesting, right? If people have seen mm. Simon, Simon Sinek's work on why, if you haven't look it up, YouTube video, Simon Sinek, why he talks about how we often communicate with each other, and he talks about what we do as an outside circle, how we do it, and the middle part is why we do it. And the, I think he used the example of Microsoft, is they talk about why they do what they do. And I often wonder whether as an industry, sometimes if we started talking about that more and getting clearer on it, we'd be less challenged about some of the, the what we do and the how we do it. Because most, uh, most farmers I know are, are pretty proud professional food producers. They manage bigger balance sheets and more complexity than what Dan and I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yet, uh, yeah, we, we call ourselves farmers, but uh, you know, really professional food producers. I think in terms of we're starting to get towards uh, the end of time here. So, Dan, I might just offer a couple of thoughts to summarise some of the things that we've covered. You know, it's times... We'll have tough times. This is cyclical. We've been here before and sadly, we'll probably be here again. But in order to get back here, we'll have to go through a bit of an upcycle too. So we should be looking to celebrate that and prepare ourselves to make the most of it when it comes. But one of the some of the lessons we learn and can apply to farming can can sometimes be better, better learned and better interpreted from other industries. I was reading a book uh, some years ago. It's, it's called Legacy, 15 Lessons in Leadership from the All Blacks, written by James Kerr. Should have just popped up on your screen there. But if you do nothing else from this session, go and find it in a library or buy it or a secondhand bookshop or something. Have a look at Chapter 9. And they talk about uh, they talk about stress and, uh, and resilience and dealing with that, going from a redhead to a bluehead in the transition. And they gave two examples in there of how different industries deal with stress. And one of them is the aviation industry. And they have a, a really simple mantra. And that mantra is basically aviate, navigate, communicate. You know, aviate, fly the plane. You must keep flying the plane. For, for us as farmers, we've got to keep farming the farm and doing the fundamentals really well. Navigate, know where you're at and where you're likely to land. What are the, some of the different options you might have? This is the budgeting piece and the revised budgeting piece. This is sitting down with your stakeholders and understanding what it really looks like, how good or bad it is, and talking about some of the options that you've got to navigate that, whether it's policy change or structural change. And communicate, get people around you. you know, get, your, get your banker involved, your accountant, your consultant, uh, your your spouse, husband, wife, any of your business partners, your farm manager, and just make sure everybody's clear about what it is that you're going to try and do to maintain the business for the future in the best possible way. So if you, if you think about that little mantra, aviate, navigate, communicate, 
it may or may not be useful for you, but you know that farm the farm piece is just critically important. We know in the dairy industry, for example, it's a lot more readily managed almost on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you're not getting your grazing right, you can see such a drop off in milk really quickly. We can't see that in sheep and beef, but it's actually, it's still happening, right? So we want to make sure that every mouthful of feed that animal takes is appropriate to its to its age and stage, and that it's the highest DME that, you, that they can get at that particular point in time. And uh, yeah, I just thought, I thought that might be interesting, just as a as an example of something from another industry. But pick that book up, uh, chapter nine. If it's the only chapter you read, read it. But there's some really good stuff in there on dealing with the challenges or the, the human response to stress and challenges and just shifting your thinking from, from not being able to do stuff to being able to do stuff. Yeah. The other, yeah. the other, sorry, you go Dan. No, I was going to, I was just going to agree with you there, Matt. It's, um, you know, those key points there uh, are pretty important and invaluable in making sure that you're taking responsibility essentially. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I'll just get Olivia to pop that one up of, uh, of our little farmer in a minute. But uh, I was talking to an old farmer friend of mine years ago, and we were talking about his goals and objectives and the challenges he was having. And he just seemed a bit flat. And I said, Billy, OK? And he said, yeah, I'm OK. I'm just a bit frustrated. I just don't feel like I can get ahead. And he said, what do you mean? He said, I feel like Gulliver from Gulliver's Travels. You know, if you can imagine this, I'm just sort of tied down. None of those individual ropes or even a collection of three or four of them are strong enough to, to hold me back from doing what I want to do. But but they're just, all of them combined is, is holding me back. And I said, well, have you ever thought about naming those ropes? And he said, well, actually, no, I haven't. And I said, well, what if, what if you did? So we got about, we sat down around the table with a cup of tea and we started, we got a piece of paper and a pen and we started writing down and naming all of these metaphorical ropes. And the two things we discovered fairly quickly was one, there wasn't anywhere near as many as he thought there was. And two, most of the ones that he was worried about sat outside of his sphere of control and influence. They weren't things that he could do anything about either directly or indirectly through others. And once we actually named those, it's a pretty quick conversation, mate, is do, do you want them? He said, no, do you need them? No, can we discard them? Yes, all right, let's focus on the stuff that's gonna make a difference. And if you think about that, uh, that other slide, Olivia, just on that control, influence and concern, if you find yourself worrying about stuff, ask, is it something I can control and influence? Is it only something I can be concerned about? Because if it's only something you can be concerned about, let's note it, park it, and get focused on the stuff you can control and influence. Because tough, tough times will come around again, and as will good times. Our challenge now is to make the most of this particular period to keep our businesses strong and fresh. Uh, with the right amount of capital available, and that's a large part of Dan's and my role, is to discover what liquidity businesses need to farm their farm and the, the animals and the people and the resources the best they possibly can as they navigate through this. So we get to the other side and you're good to go and make the most of the next upswing. Yeah, yeah I mean, Matt's right. I mean, from a bank's point of view, irrespective of what bank it is, they're always here to sit there and try and make sure that the businesses that they deal with are actually going to be well-supported and actually supported in a way that actually gets them through to what they the owners or the the, you know, the controlling people actually want to actually do. So, you know, that's where it's important to actually be inclusive with your banker and make sure that you're honest with your banker and make sure that you're actually telling them exactly what you want to do to ensure that we're all on the same page because ultimately we're here for, you know, to be part of you know, a business team. Let's not uh, sit there and try and be anything else. It's really simple. Guys, I'll um, offer you this. <clears throat> sorry, sorry, Matt. Sorry, Matt. We've, I know our time is um, is creeping up on us pretty quickly, and I just wondered if there was a couple of questions here we just might throw out and see how we go. It'll come through the chat. Um, go for it. And one is um, how competitive are banks with their margins, and how do you go about talking to the bank about reducing your margin? So it's probably a little bit of understanding of how the bank um, rates you, uh, so you can have that discussion. Yeah. Would that be fair, guys? Yeah, look, I'll uh, I'll have a crack at that one first, and then Matt can jump in behind me if he's got something else to add in there. But uh, how you go about talking to your bank about reducing your margin? Well, the first question, the first thing you do is you pick up the phone and you talk to your bank. Uh, you talk to your bank manager. Never be afraid to actually approach your bank manager. They're not that big and scary. I mean, look at Matt and I. We're Jesus. We're just uh, 
everyday people. Um, when you talk about how competitive banks are with their margins, well, by and large, we're going to be very, very similar. What you're going to find when you look at differences in margins, if you can actually point to them between one, you know, different businesses, is that banks will take a risk-based approach to pricing businesses. So the higher the risk the business presents, the higher a margin is. So then the higher the interest rate is that it's charged. So what the job, you know, what your job is, uh, people that are borrowing money and the people, you know, from our point of view is how do we actually lower that risk to actually give you some interest rate relief? And it might be like we talked about there, those the, the three prongs, uh, the three-legged stool. You know, you've got your viability, you've got the financial side of things and you've got the personal effect. If we can lower the risk on those three things there, by and large, you'll actually get yourself a lower interest rate. Okay, I think yeah, that's just probably it, pretty good. There, make, that you got make to, sure yeah. you prepare. Make sure you're prepared when you go and talk to them. Get all of your information yes. together and make sure you're really clear about what your historicals look like and what your projected looks like, mm -hmm. and and some of those why questions that we talked about that's before. It. Yep. Show us, don't tell us. Yep. I think Sorry, um, no. we had Winston Churchill quoted last week with Rod. You know, done that good crisis. Um, you know go to waste, and I think Justine could also mention this in the first one, and this might line up a bit, uh, uh, do you think tough times like this is an opportunity to sidestep to different income streams, diversity, chain stock type farm systems, or just stick with what you know? I think the question's saying, you know, is, is it actually an opportunity just to see if you have got the right mix in your business? I've, you never waste a good opportunity. Adversity equals opportunity. Don't waste a good downturn, right? That's a really good question and a great way of thinking. Very positive mindset. The key challenges around that, if you're moving away from stuff you don't know, is going into areas where you may not necessarily have the skill sets and capabilities. So it's really having a, a good think about those. Mm -hmm. And if I could finish with this, Mark and Dan, I remember I was facilitating a group in Christchurch years ago, not long after the earthquake, and we had a builder come and talk to us fascinating lovely lovely guy but he told us his experience through that earthquake he said he was sitting on the third floor of his building beautiful big raw red brick you know, natural brick lovely lovely building reasonably successful builder at, at his desk and that earthquake hit and he said three things struck him the first thing when he looked across at the wall it was like liquid it was just sort of he's going that's a double brick wall that shouldn't be doing that's, uh, that's that struck me as a bit strange the next thing that struck him was i'm going to die today and the third thing that struck him was the brick wall but he went on to talk about his experience. And if you remember the Blues Brothers, when the boys got blown up in the doorway of that building and they got up out of the, the brick and dusted themselves off, well, he, it's a, so the analogy that he gave is sort of sniffed the air and said, man, there's going to be some opportunity here. You know, the dust hadn't even settled. There's going to be some opportunity here. Mm. Now, in order for him to take advantage of that opportunity, he needed to get access to his insurance funds as quickly as he could. And he had a really good relationship with his insurer. But trying to get his insurance funds through his insurer was hopeless. You know, he used to have lunch with him and dinner and play golf and all sorts of different things, but he just couldn't get his insurance capital. And his comment was, in order for me to do the things that I needed to do in the timeframes that I had, I had to up, up aggressively upskill myself in the space of 48 mm. to 72 hours. I had to aggressively upskill myself to understand how insurance worked and how I could get access to the money that was rightfully mine, but in a time frame that was going to fit my objectives. So I think that question's a really good one. If you're going to look at changing policies, whether it's you know, land use policies, stock policies or whatever else, absolutely have a look at it. But take the opportunity to aggressively upskill yourself by bringing the right people around you, having the right conversations and asking the right questions. Mm. And it is a good time to do it. Yeah. The key there is, uh, as Matt's pointing out, is by bringing those people around you, in upskilling and uh, in what you're actually trying to understand there, it allows you to make a decision on what you do on an informed basis as opposed to an emotional basis. Emotional decisions when you're looking at change have a tendency to be a little higher, a little bit more risky uh, than one you are making with all the information and uh, on a really, really sound platform. So it's not that you can't uh, look at opportunities because there are going to be some out of this but it's making sure you understand all the ifs, buts, and maybes. Hey guys, and don't, um, underest don't underestimate yeah. the fact that you are well-equipped to do this, right? You deal yep. with adversity. You deal with complexity every day. You're more than just farmers. You're business people who, who know what you need to do. The challenge is to get people around you and just get on and do it. Yep. Look, on that note, guys, I know we just, just crossed the timeline a bit and we need to wash up. Um, just uh, a massive thanks to both... Dan and Matt, um, I think it's really good. We sort of want it to flow and just go where it wanted to go. There's a couple of three really good questions have come through. 
Um, I just a quick summary. I see. I, I liked a couple of points made, and I love that that one around. Um, oh, sorry, as we go, yeah, just a reminder that polls there. If you want to just quickly flick those out, it um, it doesn't take too long. As we sum up, please please do that. We like feedback because it helps us uh, get our uh, future things up and running in in this style. Um, yeah, that expense is seen as investments. I, I always like to use that. I think expenses should be used in a set of accounts, should be investments, because we expect a return from investment when expense is seen as an expense. So thanks for that one, Dan. It was a, it was a ripping good one. Understand what your banking partner can do with you. Fit them into your team would be my advice. Um, so fi find the one that fits into your team and, and, and utilize them. They, they want you to succeed. Uh, in knowing where you want to be. I think that's that's really really important. Yep. Um, if you know that and you write that down, you're more than likely to hit some of the some of the goals you're trying to trying to trying to achieve. And a really good point is tough times. It is cyclic. We've been through these ups and downs before, and we will so again. It's the learnings and experience you gain from them, and the opportunities you can take. Yeah, I love that legacy with James Kerr, the aviate, navigate, and communicate. Um, yeah, the, you know the mantra of the All Blacks is a lot of that's in there. But people like Gillanoka. Uh, control, influence, and concern. It's really good. The the PowerPoint will be available. We haven't gone through it all, but it'll be there to reflect on. And I, I write here the tough conversation should be had so you can move forward to achieve the goals. And I wonder, Olivia, if you can just put up that R, ah, we need to talk one um, that, that Matt had uh, on the screen, because I think it's it's a ripper in family businesses that quite often we avoid that conversation that will take us forward. So I'm just wondering a little bit if you can just put up that slide where it says, ah, oh, we need to talk. Thank you. I, I think it's a ripper. Family meeting. Does this mean we're going to talk about all those things we unconsciously agreed not to talk about? And I think knowing having been involved in a family business, if you can get that stuff out on the table, it makes a hell of a difference how you can go forward. So that's just a bit of my summary of, of the evening. Um, and what I'd like to do now is uh, just shout out to the Rural Support Trust. And, and, and both these gentlemen have worked in the space. We heard that Matt's work with Rural Support Trust and is up here. And Dan does a lot of good stuff. He did the 24 share for here for you and the team. Uh, these guys are concerned about people. So um, I just want to shout out Rural Support Trust, who are always there to have our backs in the rural sector when things are tough. We are seeing some great work being done by them in our region off the back of this year's weather events. And my challenge to you all in this area is to stay connected. Ring a mate and check in or share the load. Don't be frightened. Every now and then I spend a weekend, I'll go and ring three random mates just to have a yarn and see how they are or tell them I might be feeling that flash. Uh, that, that's a massive way to, to help each other. And as we close off, we look forward to the final webinar in the series taking place next Monday, the 16th of October at 7.30 p.m. Register now. It's going to be hosted by Katrina Stead, Beef and Lamb New Zealand's Northern North Island Extension Manager based in Whangarei with a guest, Nigel Ladder, to gain insights, practical strategies, and motivation needed to adapt, evolve, and flourish in any situation to close our webinar series off. And again, thank you very much for your attendance. Um, and, um, and to you two gentlemen, thank you very, very much for your input. As always, great working with you guys um, and, uh, and some really nice little, little wise words there and sharing of experience. Take care, everybody. Enjoy your evening.